we are going to move straight on to our next session, which is on the, um, another battleground. We've done information in the term, terms of content, but there's also an electronic battleground, which is the future of the Internet. Um, the Internet, as you know, an American-led project based on the idea of trust and, and cooperation in research, which has become the central nervous system of modern life. And we're seeing a very strong pushback, um, not just from Russia, but from many other countries, who believe that this is fundamentally offensive to their ideas of how the world should be run. They don't like the idea that the internet should have any kind of American leadership, and they don't like the idea that the internet trumps national sovereignty. And this is a, leads to the danger of what some people have called the balkanization of the internet. I don't like balkanization because it's one of these classic Western Orientalist terms like Eastern Europe, which is taking part of the world and using it as a synonym for something, something bad. So I don't I'll actually, deal with that in a moment. I don't want to call it the balkanization. I'll deal with that in a moment. But um, we have an excellent panel here um, very, um, from two different ends. Um, President Ilvis, among his many other things, is I think the only head of state in Europe and probably in the world who is able to fix your Apple Mac when it goes wrong really quickly. And I speak from, 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 from experience. Um, he is uh, deeply involved in um, both an intellectual and a cultural and a political sense in the, um, the future of, of, of the internet. And so we're going to hear from, uh, from him. And we're also very pleased to have Jean-Jacques Sahel, who is the Vice President of ICANN for Europe. Now, if you don't know what ICANN is, it doesn't really matter. It's immensely important. Um, it's, 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 it's the organisation that, if you imagine, sort of organises the telephone directory of the, of the internet. Um, I have just written a book on this subject, so I, I actually do know what ICANN is. But don't worry, we're not going to talk about that or the, internet, the um, internet Engineering Task Force or any of these other wonderful alphabet soup things. We're going to talk about the politics of it. Um, and I'm going to start off by asking um, President Ilvis um, to outline some of the things that he's been working on. Then I'm going to have Jean-Jacques uh, respond. Then we have a brief discussion, take a couple of questions to the floor, and we will finish punctually at 1 o'clock so you can all get off to your lunch. Tom. Well... I mean, we just, I mean, the problem that we face, first of all, I would argue, is, I mean, the term you used, I, I, I think was the first one to say this is a revolting term, mm -hmm. balkanization, and really, the, and that's completely wrong anyway as a descriptor, because what it is, is the, uh, in fact, what there, there is a serious attempt to, A, go, uh, to proceed with what I would call the Westphalianization of the web, which is, Cuius uh, regio, eus religio. What goes on the web in your country is your thing, and you decide. And that has been part of a uh, of a concerted effort of a uh, number of countries with less than uh, less than stellar democratic records, especially on freedom of speech. Uh, and th and the mechanism has been. Uh, the ITU, which is the, there was an attempt about three, two and a half years ago to, to get. So can you just explain what the ITU, ITU is? The ITU is a, it's a UN body, it's the International Telegraph Union, which is about 150 years old, designed to regulate telegraphs, uh, communications, and now it has sort of uh, you know, morphed into this organization that wants to deal with the internet and take it away from ICANN uh, and put it under UN uh, regulation, which then would, le which would basically then have the, uh, I mean, would, would have all of the effective policies of the UN uh, in regulating. That was a joke, guys, anyway. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and this was, this reached a culmination uh, two and a half years ago in December when the ITU met um, and uh, this effort to take it away was pushed back by what we, uh, by this, uh, this uh, coalition of countries we more or less call the Freedom Online Coalition of which we are a founding member here, uh, to stop that. Uh, then, with uh, unfortunately, with the uh, with uh, the the revelations, or at least the three or four revelations out of several hundred thousand that now sit in the Kremlin, uh, regarding or that Mr. Snowden took out, there was a renewed paranoia, and this effort is started up again. And the idea basically is to to rest uh, sort of a th uh, control of the internet away from the supposed domination of the United States. 
The United States actually has given up ICANN, or, which basically deals with uh, domain names. It just distributes domain names, DNSs, you know, little numbers that are addresses. And, um, but this is back again, and there's a strong effort on this, and, this, and the effort to you know, say, okay, one, you know, one country has its rules on the internet, then the other has its rules. And then the danger that I see is that um, that once you go be, that you go beyond that, which is that okay, mentioning something which is forbidden in your country, which is already bad enough and therefore is taken out of the internet, then becomes forbidden on the entire internet. That is, that if there is some, something that is unpopular, then one country says no, this is bad, and then it becomes forbidden. Uh, for, fortunately, we haven't gotten, we're not there. Um, the I, ICANN itself, I led a panel, uh, sort of, a, it has a very long name and I can never. Uh, That's I, okay. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, it's a long, pa a long name <laughs> panel of, we, we came to, to the conclusion that was then echoed in, uh, in Brazil last year that we try to really bring in civil society, I mean, you know, the, in the language of the UN, stakeholders. I always think of Dracula when I hear that, but anyway. Um, <laughs> All of, the, uh, all of the relevant stakeholders, uh, you know, the government, civil society, uh, private, the private sector, and we hope that this moves forward in that we don't get, we don't get nation states managing the internet, because if that happens, it loses its entire meaning. Though I do believe in conclusion that that ultimately there will remain a space of freedom in the internet. There will be those countries, the ones in the Freedom Online Coalition and others that will say, no, we will not censor, we will not prevent. And then there'll be the people who unfortunately live in countries that will not have access. And there are those countries already. Uh, Roskomnador keeps banning sites and so forth, but well, the main thing is that we in the freedom-loving West, or freedom-loving all over the world, will continue to uh, maintain and stand for a free, free, uh, both financially and in sort of in terms of freedom of speech, free internet. There's a real paradox here, because on the one hand, from a technical point of view, the internet has to be the same everywhere, mm -hmm. otherwise it, it doesn't work. Everybody who uses the internet um, thinks that what they're using it for is right, um, but not everybody agrees what right is, and we have enormous problems with child pornography, with organised crime, terrorism. And if you say to people, do you agree that the internet should not be a law-governed space, you'll have very few people putting their hands up. The disagreement is where that comes in, and once um, the Russians are in the room, or the Chinese, they will say, well, that if you want terrorism, then that means extremism, and that means, therefore, no Tibetans or Uyghurs or Chechens or, or whatever. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it goes to the heart of the way we run the international system, and you're sitting right there in the middle of it. How does it feel? Yeah, I think the middle bit is quite uh, an apt uh, expression. The, there's um, a principle which a number of governments have been mentioning over the years and which has been enshrined now by the uh, UN Human Rights Council, which is that what is illegal offline in the real world should be illegal online, broadly speaking. Of course, that's not so easy when you get to a medium like the internet, uh, which is inherently transporter, and you don't have the uh, traditional sovereign legal system applying like that. That's why we've had to, or organically, the system of governance of the internet that's emerged over the years is one that's able to deal with the inherent global transnational nature of the internet, where instead of having a traditional nation state organization for governing the internet, you have governments, but you have also the other many actors which are acting, who are acting transnationally to uh, deal with the internet, whether they are, for instance, the internet providers, the telecom companies that run the internet, or indeed civil society who have an inherent uh, perspective and, and, and interest in how the internet is run. And so when you look at the various organizations uh, that are involved in coordinating how the internet works, which includes uh, ICANN, they are known as multi-stakeholder based institutions, uh, where around the table, uh, initiating policy, developing policy, and agreeing policy by consensus are not just governments, but governments and the private sector 
and civil society and technical community, academics, etc. It's a novel form of, of governance or of coordination at a uh, global level, and it's one that is needed because of that, that in inherently global nature of the internet. That doesn't mean that everything is easy, uh, be precisely because we are dealing with fairly new challenges very often. How do you deal? Well, there are some issues which are almost universally um, uh, disliked, such as child pornography. But then when you get into other areas, well, you know, for some countries, certain things are abhorrent, and for others, they are about freedom of expression. So how do you balance that? And that new form of governance is still evolving, so not everybody, everything gets solved that easily. But also that novel form of governance is precisely new and n not uh, one that a number of governments are able to, I was going to, to use the word manipulate, um, to um, handle as effectively as they might handle traditional Westphalian systems. They cannot play the same games of influence. Uh, they cannot use real politic uh, in as effective a, a manner when around the same table are NGOs uh, claiming for freedom of speech, when there are businesses telling them what you're proposing to do, such as censoring this or censoring that, cutting off that, is technically simply not feasible. So we're faced with a, with a challenging time but, and, and an evolving governance structure, pioneering structure for governing a medium that is entirely global. I think I'd like to just quickly touch on the balance of human rights and security, uh, which okay. I think you were alluding to, and just yeah. very quickly, because I think the foreign minister of Estonia actually made a really important point yesterday, which is that we have really important uh, challenges with the internet. There are real security threats, whether we're talking about cyber attacks or indeed, as uh, the discussion has shown this morning, misuses of the, the medium that is the internet for subversive purposes. So the temptation might be one to censor, might be to try and cut it off. And on, at one level, we should do that. But on the other, I think we should never lose uh, the perspective that uh, you know, we, we should balance security with human rights and privacy, etc. Uh, and that is the, the, the basis of our civilization and the only way it's going to work. So not all of this is going to be easy, um, but making trade-off between security and privacy is a, and, and human rights is a, is a difficult, a dangerous game. So I think we should, we should always try and keep that balance. I, I very much like the, the, the words of the foreign minister yesterday. I'm well, let, let's just look at this from an Estonian point of view, because we're here. Your country is suffered the first instance of a sort of political... DDoS attack, a cyber attack, which was is the equivalent of a mass protest. If you imagine thousands and thousands and thousands no, of people, it is. well, hang on, let me just let, you can come back in a moment. Yeah, that's but, silly. Well, well, let's. There, there is an argument that just as people have the right to protest and to block a building, and then the police will try and clear away, but it's you're making a political point through force of numbers. Um, why is that any different? If people are all jamming your website because they don't like you, don't they have the right to do that? And there are people who will make that argument very strongly. They would defend DDoS attacks. Um, these distributed denial of service attacks on free, on free speech grounds? They're, well, f for one, they're simply illegal, and therefore, I mean, then you've entered a Hobbesian world, and then if you are participating as, I mean, you are protesting, then all bets are off. Anything is possible in return. That's all. I mean, it's... Um, if you're going to do something like that, then you have given up your right to be protected, if you know what I mean. So... I mean, that's where it is. Now, first of all, on sort of DDoS, I mean, it's a very primitive cyber attack. It just blocks off access. Uh, most of the time we're talking about, when we talk about cybersecurity, we're not talking about DDoS attacks. I mean, basically, DDoS attacks are mafioso, I mean, they're mafioso spam sites, mafioso-owned spam sites. A DDoS, you are participating in a criminal organization by doing, I mean, but, okay, just so I understand. DDoS attacks use botnets. Botnets, most of the time, are used to send you Viagra ads and other things of that nature. And they go outward. And then the way the, D the botnet works then is you can rent them from mafioso groups, organized crime, which also a state can do, so you get a unique form of public-private partnership there, um, as we did here recently, in 2007. And then you, you send all, instead of sending it, you know, three million, Viagra ads out, you send them all to one server, and then the server is overloaded. Uh, 
that's not really much on cybersecurity. The real cybersecurity issues have to do with altogether different issues, not blocking as access and getting in and doing all kinds of nasty stuff and stealing stuff. And that's a whole different ball game, and that's 99.999% of what we are worried about. DDoS attacks, they unfortunately exist. They're mainly used, uh, by the way, for extortion. Again, criminal activity, going, okay, you know, company that sells something, we will, we will uh, sell something on the internet. We will now block your site unless you pay ransom. I mean, you're, basically, these people are participating in, in this so called civil action is participating in a criminal ring and therefore liable for any kind of prosecution for dealing with mafiosos. And the same tactics can be used by spies, foreign military, pranksters, hooligans activists or whatever, and that's one of the, the, the problems, that you have the, the vulnerabilities on the internet can be exploited by all sorts of different okay. yeah. actors, and you don't have... I, uh, if, I, if I could expand on that, just so, to, to, to give a sort of analogy, if I may, for a DDoS attack. It's a bit as if, and, and botnets, a bit as if you were driving your car, and for some reason your car is remote controlled. It's one of those new Google cars. And someone has hijacked the control of these cars, and all of a sudden, 100,000 cars converge on Estonian motorways and basically block the motorways. The whole country is gridlocked. Nothing can work. The economy is stopped. That's pretty much it, right? I think that's, yeah. And that was pretty much what happened, unfortunately, in 2009. Seven. Seven, sorry. Um, now, you can do that if you're a non-state actor, you're a criminal organization. Or you can do that if you're a state actor or a combination of both. And now that the internet is so pervasive and that you can link the internet with other networks, such as networks that control critical infrastructure, for instance. You could uh, potentially conduct uh, acts of, uh, uh, I was going to use the term warfare, that might not be the right term, but certainly attacks against essential facilities. You could think about nuclear. You, there, there have been examples already of state, well, supposedly, state actions against nuclear facilities in some countries. You could do it across, uh, against banks and financial services. For now, it's done a lot by criminal organizations for extortion purposes. But states could do that. And there have been rumors of terrorists using it for exactly the same purposes. And, there is, and what is, I mean, you've got two ways of dealing with this. What President Ilves was just saying is that you, um, once you behave as a malefactor on the internet, you lose your immunity. You can be attacked by kinetic means. The police can come and arrest you. Um, you may get bombed. Well, the, I was the, uh, well Marvin, the, the uh, Department of Defense three years ago, U.S. Department of Defense said that there is no reason to assume that a digital attack or an attack in the digital world needs need be met with an attack in the same domain. That is to say, <laughs> we can bomb you. So that so that's one response. Is if you do bad stuff on the internet, we will come after you, whether with our military, with our criminal justice. We may hack into your computer, make it explode. We will, there's an entire range of kinetic and digital responses, and that's sort of one way of policing the internet. The other is to say um, there are things on the internet we can make impossible, just as you cannot have at the moment a... If, you, if, if I try and take over president.ee, there is a rule at ICANN that means I can't register president.ee, it's registered to e President Ilvis, and yes. I can't have it. And that sort of internet, that's not enforced by kinetic means, that's just an, an internet rule. And so you can also argue that the internet needs to increase its own internal regulation based on this stakeholder's decision-making, maybe, which will just make, make, which, which will make more things impossible. So I think we have the basis of that. We have basic rules that, in theory, should protect against that, but then you have also the reality, which is that you can unfortunately hijack that domain through technical means. And that's where a different model of governance is needed, particularly because on the internet, unfortunately, you can hide very easily. So you might have an attack which looks like it's coming from China, and then actually it's going, it's going to, in fact, you might trace it back to the US and then trace it back to Latvia, and then it gets lost somewhere else. Uh, so you need cooperation at the international level, and very often states themselves are far too limited to, to be able to do that. They require cooperation from private actors. That's where we need far more cooperation, what we used to call public-private partnership, which I was now called multi-stakeholder governance. When I was in government, we called it public-private partnership. We, we didn't know better. We didn't know we had to use draculian <laughs> terms. <laughs> Um, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, there thing. are, in fact, international agreements. Um, the Budapest Convention, now called the Budapest Convention, but it was the Council of Europe Agreement, but since it expanded to include other 
uh, law-abiding rule of law countries such as the United States and Australia and Japan is now the Budapest Convention, which basically obligates countries that uh, to extradite or participate in criminal investigations in the case of crimes committed in the, on the internet. Unfortunately, uh, the correlation between the countries that have not signed the agreement and the sources of criminal activity on the internet is more or less uh, one or 100%. Uh, so in fact, uh, the main perpetrators of criminal acts uh, on the internet are countries that refuse to sign and hitherto have refused to sign the Budapest Convention that would obligate them to cooperate on legal investigations of cyber crime. And that's, uh, so that's, that kind of determines the limits of international cooperation in the cyber world because rule of law countries follow rule of law and countries that don't have rule of law don't sign this and so therefore we're just as victimized as before with the few cases in which some idiot in a rule of law country decides to go into cyber crime but then he gets arrested and usually extradited to the United States which is the main victim of these crimes. If I, if I may just yes, and you have that. to straddle this world between the, the rule of law countries and the countries that wouldn't describe themselves as non-rule of law countries but just don't feel like cooperating with the Western criminal justice system. So there's, there's two aspects I'd like to catch up on. The first one, if you allow me, is that the Budapest Convention is just a convention on cyber crime. And one issue that surfaced in the last two or three years in particular when we started hearing about surveillance scandals is that actually even for law-abiding states, because the internet is so novel and, and cyber issues are so novel, we actually do not have the framework or even the sort of tacit codes that we used to have, for instance, during the Cold War. There is no real understanding of how states should behave towards each other in the cyber world, right. so beyond cyber crime. So this is certainly not something that we and I can deal with. It's just a, a consideration. And I think you know, it's, it's quite interesting that after the Snowden affair, uh, the top IT companies in the world, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, etc., came together, Apple, and they issued an open uh, call, in particular to the US president, but also to uh, international governments or to foreign governments, saying, please work on some sort of uh, uh, multilateral framework to deal with surveillance. Because at the moment, we as industry, or we as users, are just caught in between. And at the moment, there's just bodies all over the floor. But it's virtual. We don't realize that. If this had been the Cold War, we would find agents, foreign agents, in you know, back streets, laying down on the, on, on the ground every single day. They would have decimated each other's uh, spy population. But there was a code in the Cold War. We don't have that sort of code in the cyber world yet. So that's one element which is important to realize. It's all very new, and there's very little understanding. The second part, you were telling me about the rule of law versus non-rule of law, and I'll, I'll address that very quickly. What's been interesting is that we've seen uh, a, 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 an, an evolution whereby a number of countries have realized that actually, even if they are not uh, Western democracies, you know, in, in our sense, the internet's globality and unicity is very important to them and their economies. So, if we look at China, for instance, they came out last year publicly endorsing the fact that they want a one global internet and that they do support this idea of a novel, multi stakeholder approach to governance. Right. So, there has been that movement from some states. So there is hope. Like the Foreign Minister of Estonia yesterday, I'd like to be optimistic. Um, I see two points we'll take very quickly from the floor. There's Yanis Kazachins, who knows a thing too about this. Um, briefly, if you don't mind. Uh, Yanis Kazachins from uh, uh, Latvia. Uh, since 2007 attacks on Estonia, um, a lot of people who are concerned with security uh, have been uh, thinking about what cyber attacks might mean at a time of heightened tension. Indeed, the Gerasimov doctrine, uh, if you look at the eight phases, the first four phases are non-military anyway, and cyber attacks play a significant role. Um, my question is, uh, with the problems of attribution that you've both alluded to already, um, uh, does it make sense 
to uh, develop an offensive capability of the sort that we've heard from time to time? And uh, is there a possibility that at some stage we might have cyber deterrence? Nice, easy question, and we'll take one from Charles Grant as well. Um, on the balance between privacy and security, the British intelligence services and the British government complain that the American IT companies are using so much encryption now and they are refusing to uh, give access to intelligent, Western intelligence services to things wanted by those services. And there's a real standoff between them. What is the way forward uh, for the relationship between intelligence services and American IT companies? So there's two great questions. One on the, the role of offensive um, cyber weapons and one on this tension between encryption, which the customer wants, and the ability to crack the encryption, which is what law enforcement wants. Probably not directly within ICANN's room, but I'll come to you very briefly and then more substantial answer from um, President oh, Come on, don't. <laughs> ah, start with the President. Oh, OK. Um, no, I I, I'd so love to go more. for cyber disarmament, personally, but um, I, I think the reality is that, I, uh, you know, there's a lot of people in the room that may be able to tell us in the Chatham House rule what is the reality, but I would suspect that most militaries around the world are developing offensive capabilities in this field, or already have. I'd be very surprised if they hadn't. Uh, and, and, are they, and is offensive capability part of the multi-stakeholder uh -huh. model? Uh, in other realms than cyber warfare, yes. Uh, that's just in terms of defending or promoting your interests, but that's a very yes. separate... And, not, yeah. and, and is there any internet gov governance point on encryption? Is this, is, uh, uh, yeah, so I mean, this is, again, this is outside of ICANN's room, and this is the broader realm of internet governance. Uh, I mean, you know, that's one of the points of details that, that's been going on for years. I mean, the, the, the encryption issue uh, has been going on for 30 odd years. There were some very weird projects developed in the UK in the late 90s that were later abandoned. I think we're just going to have a, a constant conflict. There's a number of court cases at the moment. Um, actually, it's between the U.S. Uh, courts, uh, or at least one U.S. court, and IT companies. Uh, we'll see which way uh, that goes. And, you know, ultimately, it will be for all of us, for our legislature or for our courts, to decide what is the right balance. Uh, I think we, on that particular front, I'm hoping that we do already have the right legislative framework. The question and the difficulty is how you apply it in, in the current context and, and the evolution of technology. Okay. I think just very, very quickly, and, and President Ilves knows that very well, I think one of the main problems we have is a problem of awareness and education. A lot of the people in and law enforcement need uh, to learn about how this all works. And institutions such as Europol are doing a great job in trying to reach out, for instance, to, to, to European police forces and explain how the internet works, basically, and what they can and can't do. But there's still an awful lot of work to do. And I think a number of law enforcement agencies just don't want to understand what is right, what is wrong, what they can and can't do. So there's a huge amount of work in, in spreading out expertise. So how far is it a problem of legislation and politics, and how far is it a problem of education? Let me ask you the question. Go ahead. I mean, basically, all right. I mean, there's some basic things. First of all, DDoS attacks, and most of what we're talking about in terms of the, the, is, the, is one issue, and then all the other stuff is going into computers. I mean, it's like either you, you, don't, you can't put your key in the lock, and the other thing is all that happens once you go in the door. And, and there's some so separate problems that, I mean, they're hard to talk about, but they all get called cyber attacks. And when it comes to cyber deterrence, I mean, it's just deterrence. I mean, as I mentioned the DOD statement, you know, if you attack us in cyber, we'll attack you perhaps in some other mode. And so that you have to deal with that all the time. Uh, you know, sort of if someone does a DDoS attack to you and you do a DDoS attack back, that doesn't, I mean, you even anyway, you have the problem of figuring out who did it and the forensics may take a while. But the point is that, um, Deterrence need not be in the same domain. It's not, you know, so it's, that's not a problem, uh, or it is a problem, but the point is that um, DDoS attacks are things that you can deal with fairly easily. I mean, you have mirror sites. I mean, we did, during the Georgian-Russian war, where is Mr. Ilyanov? Anyway, the, the Russian war against uh, Georgia, uh, we, we just helped them out, and we provided mirror sites. So when they went and took down sites, 
And of course, there's these sort of there's this this uh, mix in which they took down sites in areas they were about to bomb. So there was this correlation right right before they would bomb someplace, they take down the website. So it it, it, it all gets mixed up. It's all warfare, and that's on the encryption issue. Um, this is strictly my personal view. But knowing technology, I think that, the, in, that encryption is going to be, and this is what makes the future dangerous, is that you will not be able to legislate encryption. You cannot legislate encryption outside your borders. I make this joke, which is unfortunately true or was, that at RSA 2048, we have two levels of encryption in Estonia, two levels higher than LavaBit, which used RSA 512, if this means anything to you, in the US. Well, it's anyway, it's two orders of magnitude higher than what LavaBit, which is a company that stored, da uh, stored Snowden's data, and NSA could not break into it. So we have twice, or you now have as number one, of the uh, e-residents. You have a level of encryption mm -hmm. so high that, uh, that NSA can't break into it. How are you gonna legislate that across borders? You're not, and that is going to be a problem that we will have to deal with unless everyone signs an agreement that there will be no encryption. But then what's, I mean, I don't see that happening. Um, I think, uh, so I mean, that's a future danger. I think encryption will be a problem that we will have with us for a long time. I mean, or forever. Uh, and if one country decides to ban encryption, how are you going to prevent Ed Lucas from using the Estonian RSA 2048, and if we go over to elliptical, it'll be something even worse or better, uh, from writing me uh, encrypted emails that no one will ever break into, or they'll spend a year breaking into to find out, he says, let's have lunch. Uh, in fact, I do that sometimes to some people in certain countries. I write them encrypted emails saying, let's have lunch, and figure, well, like, someone will have to spend a lot of time on that. Um, <laughs> Talk, talking of lunch, we're almost out of time. Yeah, OK, yeah. and let me, but let me just say something. That uh, when we look at cyber, I think we ha we're going to have to take a new approach. You know, when Al Gore said 25 years ago, it's the information highway, it is a highway. The problem is it's a, you know, a, a massive highway. I don't know how many lanes and no one's driving with a license plate. Mm -hmm. So if you, there are no license plates, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, what are you gonna do? Uh, and anything can happen. And so what will happen ultimately, I predict, is that those countries or those people who will want to have security, sort of reasonable, I don't mean just encryption, but general security, will in fact adopt a, on a voluntary basis, or in, as in the case of Estonia, on a, on a non-voluntary basis, a unique ID system. The UK is adopting the Estonian system, but on a voluntary basis, you get, you have real, real security if you want it. If you don't, you go with your gas bill to prove that you're you, which is what you do in the UK when you go to the bank, right? Because no one could ever fake a gas bill. No. Right, that, precisely. That uh, so anyway, yeah. I think what we will see internet. is uh, <laughs> that those people who want to have secure connections, not, not encrypted, but just, you know, you know that no one's going to break into your bank account, will adopt a system, something of the sort that we have, which is two-factor. It's not enough to have a simple password. I mean, every time I buy a book from Amazon, you know, I go, I can't believe I'm putting in my credit card. Uh, and to this thing with a password. I mean, I'm an idiot, but um, but the future is going to be far more. Uh, I mean, it'll be voluntary, I predict. But it will. You will have to succumb to uh, a unique identity, verifiable identity, identity, if you really want to be secure. And if I could just close by giving a little plug for the Estonian ID system. What is absolutely brilliant about this is not is you can prove who you are, but you can also tell who other people are. So if you get an, an email from an Estonian, you actually know that really was the Estonian. And if he, the email then says, please click on this link or have a look at this document, you know that it really does come from that person. And that's something you just don't have with n any other electronic communication you get. And so I think that your point of, of opting in to security, both be able to prove who you are mm. and also in the knowledge that the people you're dealing with are who they claim to be. Um, is, is, has got real legs. So if you haven't already done so, please sign up for your Estonian e-resident card. It's great fun, it only takes a minute. Um, and on that note, please um, join me in thanking President Ilves and Jean-Jacques for their uh, contributions.